Hello and welcome. My name is Jeremy and on my senior design team is Nick, Primate, and Casey. Our project focused on creating an ethanol biofuel synthesized from sugarcane. This process is essential to decrease the global dependency on fossil fuels by creating a safe and competitive alternative to standard gasoline. Brazil was the first country to manufacture ethanol from sugarcane. Using their advanced agriculture industry technologies and bountiful amount of arable land, they were able to become the first country to have successfully sustainable biofuel economy. The technology was first developed in the 1920s, but was not refined to be more cost effective than fossil fuels until the 1970s. Ethanol has been used as an additive to standard gasoline. In Brazil, the government has been fluctuating regulations between 10 to 27 percent since the anhydrous ethanol has been added to the gasoline. With an increase of anhydrous ethanol being added to the gasoline, minor changes need to be done to the car's engines in order to burn this fuel. In America, only 10 percent of anhydrous ethanol is added to the gasoline. This addition of ethanol to gasoline helps to lower emissions and oxygenate the fuel. Ethanol can also be used as an additive for many household products, such as nail polish remover, paints, and cleaning products. Another benefit from the process involves burning the excess biomass that is not turned into sugarcane juice used to create ethanol. This biomass is exothermic when burned, therefore the heat can be used to generate electricity. This electricity generation is enough to power the process as well as can create extra electricity that can be sold for a profit. As previously mentioned, ethanol has a myriad of uses, but in this project we focused on its ability to replace traditional motor gasoline as either part of the blend market as E10 or E85, which are mixtures of gasoline and ethanol, or as pure ethanol fuel, which is called E100. The main rationale for this is due to the observed price increase of gasoline over time. In this graph here, we have plotted data extracted from the Energy Information Administration, EIA, which has data back around 30 years ago when gasoline was about $1 per gallon, which has now increased, or which has increased to almost $2 to $3 around 2010. And these prices have been adjusted for the 2020 US dollar. These prices are then expected to continue to increase over time due to the increase in demand. So what can we use to produce ethanol? In this presentation, we'll be going over sugarcane-based ethanol, but in the U.S. currently, corn is ingrained in the culture to produce with corn-based ethanol. However, with this information from the EIA in this plot here, we see that the price of corn is pretty volatile. Five years ago, it was around 6 to $8 per bushel of corn, which now has decreased to $4 per bushel. With the current uh, conversions from a corn a bushel of corn to a gallon of ethanol, it will cost about a dollar forty three in raw materials to produce one gallon of ethanol. Conversely, sugarcane's price currently is about forty dollars per ton, which has seen to be decreased over time, with an estimated cost of two dollars of raw material to produce a gallon of ethanol. However, these uh, estimations were made with first generation processes which can be improved upon, which we will discuss further in the presentation. The EIA provides information with both low and high reference cases for the projected prices of ethanol, gasoline, and the blends. As seen on the low and high reference cases in these graphs here, the prices for E85 and gasoline both are above ethanol and in the high reference case are expected to increase indefinitely up to 2050 with five dollars per gallon. However, the price of ethanol, E100, in both the low and high reference cases are expected to stay relatively consistent at $1.50 per gallon. This will be useful for consumers to have a low-cost uh, fuel that they can use in their vehicles. So it looks like there are quite a bit of savings in price by using ethanol-based alternatives. However, we should ask the question, do ethanol-based alternatives work as well as gasoline on a per gallon basis? And the short answer is no, they don't. Approximately 1.4 gallons of E85 fuel has the same energy content or energy density as one gallon of traditional motor gasoline. This conversion increases to 1.5 for E100. If we use the projected prices in 2022 with E100 around $1.50 per gallon and the conversion rate, you would pay about $2.25 in E100 
to meet the same energy output as one gallon of motor gasoline. However, this is still a savings of about 75 cents, which is, uh, which is good. However, there are a lot of factors to consider before the market can lessen its dependence on motor gasoline. Currently, only about 5 to 10 percent of cars are flex fuel vehicles, which are approved to use E85 in the U.S. And with ethanol-based alternatives in the U.S., the only ones really commercially available at large scale are E10, which is only 10 percent ethanol. That's why research in this uh, domain in sugarcane-based ethanol would be important to increase the availability of ethanol-based alternatives and make it easier to lessen our dependence on motor gasoline in the future. There are two major ways ethanol can be synthesized from sugarcane. The primary process is called first generation. This involves using pure sugarcane to produce a sugarcane juice. The sugarcane juice is the product obtained from the extraction stage of the process and then is fed into the fermenters along with the yeast. The sugarcane biomass that cannot be converted into sugarcane juice is then burned in a furnace to create electricity to power the process. Once the sugarcane juice is fermented, it can be distilled and dehydrated in order to increase its purity. An additional process to synthesize ethanol from sugarcane is called second generation. The second generation involves treating the sugarcane bagasse to increase the ethanol yield from the sugarcane. This process involves pre-treating the biomass by milling and steam explosion. This produces a liquid and solid fraction. The liquid fraction can be evaporated and filtered with activated charcoal to produce additional sugars. The solid fraction is hydrolyzed with enzymes to produce sugars. These sugars can then be fermented, distilled, and dehydrated to produce ethanol. Throughout our project, our focus was on first generation of ethanol. The second generation process does not give a high enough ethanol yield and therefore was neglected. Instead, the bagasse will be converted into electricity through a furnace highlighted on the previous page. Shown here is a super pro model of the entire process going from start to finish, going from the, sh the raw sugarcane biomass all the way to anhydrous ethanol. You see the various steps from the heating and milling and filtration all the way to fermentation, the various distillation columns and dehydration. First, the juice, the sugar cane has to be milled to extract the juices. Then the juice has to be heated up and limed, which precipitates some of the, some of the undesired impurities. Then it has to be flashed, which removes all air. Then it's, filter, then it's filtered and the solid filtrant is pressed into a cake. Not the kind of cake you want to eat for your birthday. This cake is gross. <laughs> straight it's just straight raw plant material and from there it's ready to be evaporated and then fermented coming out of juice treatment the juice is going to have a concentration of about 10 percent sucrose that isn't high enough for fermentation so what we're going to have to do is evaporate it three times in series and that'll uh that'll concentrate it enough to begin fermentation from there the sugar juice is fed to a fermenter mixing with a yeast stream at 37 degrees Celsius. The final product streams contain ethanol, but at a very low concentration. The ethanol in those streams must be separated from carbon dioxide, water, yeast, and all the un un all unreacted starting material because the conversion isn't 100%. It's 92%, which is pretty high, but it's not 100%. The gas product stream, which contains most of the carbon dioxide, is fed through an absorption column, which filters out the carbon dioxide. The two product streams, one coming out of the fermenter, the other coming out of the absorber, are combined and fed into a distillation column. The product vapor stream from that distillation column contains about 55% ethanol, which is better, but still not good enough. Then it's fed into a rectification column, which is basically just a multi-stage distillation column. And the product stream out of that one contains 93% ethanol. That product stream is then condensed. So in order to be fuel grade ethanol that can be mixed with gasoline, it has to be 99% purity, which cannot be achieved by a distillation column. So from there, we have to dehydrate the ethanol stream using molecular sieves. And that produces 99% pure ethanol. And then, and from there, it's good to be used as a solvent or a fuel. This, this here is a table outlining 
all the different cost factors involved in sugar in ethanol production from sugarcane doesn't actually have sugarcane prices or the usage rate of sugarcane, but it has a bunch of other stuff. Natural gas, yeah. Different coal prices, wage prices, yada, yada, yada. At a sugarcane crushing rate of 500 tons per hour and at a price of $38 per ton, it was determined that this is an extremely profitable process. The initial cost of the equipment runs out to about 170 million, which is a lot, but at 180, at 180 days per year operation, which is only half the year, sugarcane season, it's determined that it has, pro has a net profit of roughly $800 million US dollars, which is pretty good. All right, and now that we've got through the economic analysis, we're going to move on to our life, life cycle analysis and environmental impact of our ethanol from sugarcane process. Um, this is going to involve taking a look at the life cycle analysis of the process itself, as well as the environmental impacts of sugarcane growing and the use of ethanol. And the first touch on the impact of sugarcane growing in the world um, there are some problems that arise from this. The first of which, uh, which is the most covered in the news recently, has been the large amounts of deforestation that we have been seeing in Brazil. Uh, this also affects other countries that don't grow as much sugarcane as Brazil, such as places like Thailand, uh, India, Indonesia, and southern U.S. states. Um, this deforestation is quite the issue. It destroys uh, many environments and ecosystems. Um, another issue with sugarcane growing is that uh, historically, when growing sugarcane, the excess waste, so the bagasse from the sugarcane, has just been burned. Uh, this does release a lot of carbon dioxide into the environment. Um, also, large, growing large amounts of sugarcane does lead to depleting nutrition in the soil. Um, this leads to, uh, you know, the best thing we can use to describe this would be something similar to the Dust Bowl that was happening in the 1930s from overgrowing crops and reusing the same fields year after year. Now, there are also some benefits from generating ethanol from sugarcane. Uh, the first kind of goes against what I said in the previous slide. Uh, we're still burning that bagus from the sugarcane, but instead of just burning it in a field, uh, we're going to be using that energy created from burning it uh, to power our process as well as selling the excess. Uh, this is seen as a positive. as It's kind of a two-for-one. We're getting rid of that bagus, and we are generating electricity. Um, the second you know, benefit from this is that ethanol is a, a clean additive, uh, and conventional fuel that you get from the gas station, 15% uh, of that liquid weight can be ethanol, and that is a, a good additive. Um, and then there's also other fuel sources. It's not in the U.S., but in countries like Brazil, where ethanol production is much higher from sugarcane, there are fuel sources called E85 fuel. Um, they are for specific cars and engines, but this fuel is a lot cleaner than gasoline. It releases a lot less carbon dioxide um, and it does slow the uh, global warming issue that we will talk on in the next slide. Um, and speaking of global warming, sugarcane growing is becoming a lot more viable as our average temperature globally increases. Uh, sugarcane grows primarily in very tropic regions, and as temperature increases, those tropic regions are expanding uh, down to places like southern Brazil or up into places like Louisiana or Arkansas or uh, Florida and whatnot. All right, and now we'll take a look at the life cycle analysis that we generated using the Open LCA application. Um, if we take a look at the graph on the right, we'll, we'll notice that there are a variety of different uh, environmental concerns that have been plotted, um, and the scores on the left on the y-axis indicate uh, it's an arbitrary value based on the impact of uh, the process compared to each one of these concerns. Uh, and we do see that in all the values are negative, which is a good thing. 
Um, this is primarily due to the energy generated. It does tend to offset most of the concerns that arise from this sugarcane process, including the carbon dioxide emission and the water usage. Um, however, this doesn't include uh, where the sugarcane comes from, so the effect of the farming of the sugarcane, nor does it take into account the usage of this ethanol that is generated from the process. Um, we do see that the biggest impact it has is on the water scarcity, and it has a very good negative impact on that. Um, this is due to the extra energy being allowed to use to purify water that usually would not be usable as drinking water or like just usable potable water. 